Today's class, by Rabbi Shor's request, is called Why Do Good Things Happen to Bad People? But also includes Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? So I want to address the following. When I first started preparing for a class on this topic of this nature, I was teaching in a yeshiva, not here in Eshat Torah, but in another place in Pizgat Ze'ev. And I walked into the base medrash there, the study house, where you guys learned in the mornings, right? They're not over here again, but there I was. And when I walked in, all the lights were off except for one in the front left corner. And there was a guy sitting there. His name was Nathan. It still is. And Nathan is sitting there, and he is studying. I remember to this day, he was studying something called Mishle, Proverbs. And as he's sitting, studying in the front left corner, I walk in, and I see him over there, and I go, Nathan. And he does like this. He's like, yes. So I said, why do bad things happen to good people? So he goes, what are bad things? And who are good people? Exactly, that's what I was thinking, like deep. You know, violin comes in, you know, some mafia guy starts shooting people in slow motion. You know, I was thinking, like, what just happened? Yeah, but you know, I thought about it, it as a very profound statement, and it really is pretty deep. You see, when we go ahead and we say, why do bad, when we say bad things, good people, we're making massive assumptions, right? Number one, we got to ask is, what is bad, right? What, some would call it what's bad, and who's good? Does that make sense? Who's good? Or vice versa, what's good and who's bad? You understand that? Right away, we're making an assessment and a judgment by saying that this person was good and this thing is bad. This person is good, this thing is bad. Or by saying this person is bad and this thing is good. Does everybody hear what's happening here? See what's going on? This is a massive assumption. There was a fellow by the name of Dennis Rader. Have you heard of him before? Noise. How did you know it so quickly? It's a bit scary. Anyway, so... Dennis Rader was known as a BTK killer, which is a little bit redundant, but BTK stands for Bind, Torture, and Kill. For between the 1970s and I think 2006 is when he, what, right, 2006 or seven is when he got finally nailed. He killed about, I think, 12 people, something like that. And what he would do is he would bind, torture, and kill them, right? Hence the name. This Dennis Rader, who was he? He was, uh, worked in the church. He was the head of the Boy Scouts. He was the kind of guy that if you needed help, you go to Dennis Rader. You hear that? If you were to watch this guy fall down the staircase, everyone would be like, oh, no, a lot of bad things happen to good people, right? This guy's a good guy. He's an upstanding citizen who just happens to murder on the side of his hobby. Right? But you didn't know that, right? So you go and you're like, why do bad things happen to good people? That's number one. What's, right? Who's bad? What's good? Who's good? What's bad? All right, now let's take the focus on the other angle of not the person but the thing. When I was about five years old, I was uh, living in New Jersey. Yeah. And we had a maid. And the maid opened up a cabinet. I was standing there, and a plate fell, and it cracked on my head. That explains a lot. I get it. And the bottom line is what happened? Thank God it didn't crack my head, but it cracked on my head. Right? Do you see right over there? Do you notice anything? Yeah. Why are you looking at it? Anyway, there's what that I have a little indentation over here because it, you know, caused a major gash over there. My mother felt it was time now to inculcate me into her cult, and she took me to this massive building. Right? I'm like bleeding out of my face. She takes me to this building, and there was a guy there, and the guy looks at it, and then he goes, "Okay, what we're going to do now?" And he, he proceeds. He took a very uh, a big piece of metal, a piece of metal, and he said, "We're now going to put this in your head." I said, "No, you're not," and I ran. My mother grabbed me. I said, "You're with them." And they proceeded to hold me down as they literally took this piece of metal and stuck it into my head. Messed up. And I'm screaming, a lot of bad things happen to good people. What was it? Some of you are like, well, this is messed up, right? The rest of you may have figured it out. A piece of metal was a needle, right? And what they were doing is, is they were numbing the area to give me stitches. You understand? But being five years old, I don't know what's going on. Therefore, I'm like, why are these bad things happening to me? The answer is, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Get it? So we go and we have these visions of like who's good, who's bad, and what's bad, and what's good. But you got to figure that out. Maybe you're totally off. Is that clear? Step number two. Step number two, when a person goes ahead and asks the question, why do bad things happen to good people? They're essentially saying three things. It's an amazing thing. We're saying this without even realizing that we're saying it. What are these three things that we're saying? Three things we're saying is the following. Prerequisite to is that we're saying that there's a God or that there's some sort of order. And saying if everything is just random, if everything in life is random, then why do bad things happen to good people? The answer is simple, because it's random. 
And therefore, there's no reason to be bothered by it because it is what it is. Life goes on. Do you understand that? If you really felt and lived a life that world, the world was random, then you should never be bothered by the ideas that occur, meaning you might not want it. But okay, you go on. It is. It happened. Like, you know, as right, Forrest Gump said it best, <clears throat> happens. Yeah? Okay, you don't know what I'm saying? Good. So now let's go on and seek. When we're saying that, we're, why we're asking the question, what about the game of good people? What are we saying? These three things. What are the three things we're saying? Number one, no particular order, but we're saying that God is all knowing. We're saying that this God is all powerful, and we're saying that this God is all good. Does everybody understand why? Think it through. Let's take away one of them. Let's say for a moment we had a cell phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's say for a moment we had the following idea. Yeah, I bet you are. You nailed me. Okay, let's say we have the idea. I give you a blessing. You should have a lot of money. Amen. 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 You too. Thank you. Amen. Okay, so now what? Number one is that all-knowing. Let's say we were to take away all-knowing. Okay? Now we're left with what? All-powerful and all-good. Why do bad things happen to good people? God just didn't know about it. Had he known about it, he wouldn't have let it happen. Get it? And we'd answer the question. Wonderful! If you're still not satisfied, <laughs> that means that you don't really think that way, do you? In which case, what? Let's say he's all-knowing and all-good. He's just not powerful. Couldn't do anything about it. If he could, he would have. But he can't. Also would answer it, right? Number three. Let's say he's all-knowing and all-powerful. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because God is bad. Would that answer all these questions? And then we're totally fine? You might not be happy with it, but that would be it. Answers, but yet, nonetheless, some of us might still be bothered, in which case we're coming with that assumption, whether we know it or we don't, whether we just accepted it as a little kid or whatever, the reason we have the idea of belief or faith or knowledge, whatever state we're on, right? But the bottom line is that we have something going on that we're still troubled by this, so there's got to be something a little bit deeper. So now let's go a little bit further. We can understand that we're going to be working off the premise that Judaism does set forth that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. It has to be He's all-knowing and all-powerful because everything's coming from Him. We didn't get into that ever. We never sat down and went through this step by step. It would have been nice to, but maybe you saw it in other classes, but a prerequisite for another time. But God is all knowing and all powerful and all good, so then what about things happen to good people? So let me ask you a question. How bad does something have to be in order to warrant the question, why do bad things happen to good people? I'll make it clear. If we say God is all good, percentage-wise, what does that mean? 100%, right? If we say he's all good, that means he's 100% good. If God is 100% good, what do you have to see to now ask, wait a minute, what's going on here? Point, zero, 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 you don't even know what I'm going to say, 1%. You know what I'm saying? By the way, um, Adam, for now, until we get to that one, delta, as we call it, yeah? The smallest number you can be. In other words, as soon as something doesn't look 100% good, that means that now that's called bad. But if God is 100% good, that means that really we wouldn't ever see bad. Do you, hear what I, do you get what I just said? In which case, when you guys say Holocaust, and you say death, and you say car crashes, and, and all these type of ideas, that's, that, that's like 1%, or that's like 50%, or like 60%. Do you, you get what I'm, you understand what I'm saying? Yet? In which case, why is it that many people have a hard time with the concept of going into the, this question of why do bad things happen to good people, is because they're coming from a certain angle that we're going to have a very hard time to deal with the question. How come? Because it goes like this. Now, you guys had Rabbi Berger? You had Rabbi Berger? Okay, so I'm going to pull a Rabbi Berger. I'm going to pull a Rabbi Berger move on you now, okay? Which essentially means I'm going to say something which is going to annoy you just for the sake of annoying you, okay? Here we go. But the truth is, it's true. From an intellectual standpoint, there is no difference between the Holocaust and stubbing your toe. Does everybody understand that? From a perspective of coming to ask the question of why do bad things happen to good people, as soon as something is bad, it should bring out the question. There's a massive difference between right, the Holocaust and stubbing your toe. But in just bringing out the question, there's no difference. You know, it's just to bring it out, just to even ask it. Now, obviously, it's going to bother you. That was my purpose, right? But now let me explain. Yeah, now let's break it down. Here we go. Now, ultimately, it makes a difference now depending on where we're coming from. Let's say you have a Holocaust survivor. Or, you know, let's not say that one. That might be too intense. I, I have a friend who unfortunately passed away pretty young. He was 27. He was married. He had one kid. <clears throat> and I, came, I was at the funeral. 
And it was here in Jerusalem. Has anyone ever been to a funeral before? Ever? Anywhere? Uh, in Jerusalem, anyone been to a funeral? Anyone been to a funeral at night? Funeral at night? Yeah? You at one also? Yeah. Where? Uh, oh, over here. So it's, you know, if you're walking with the whole crowd, it's okay, right? There's a lot of people. But if like, you veer off, it's a little bit freaky, you know what I mean? To be in a cemetery at night and whatever it is, you know, with all the movies that you guys have seen, right? So, so what happens? There was, uh, as they're burying this, this boy, the mother is there, and she's screaming. And you have to picture just the scene of, like, nighttime cemetery. Her son, 27 years old, and she's screaming, why? Why? Why did this have to happen? Why? What's the answer to her question? What's the answer to her question? What do you say, people? The answer is, there is no answer. Now, excuse my blasphemy. Even God doesn't know. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, there was no, there's no answer. You know why there's no answer? Because, let's see if you can figure it out. There was no question. What do I mean there was no question? Have you ever been to a house of mourning before? Casa de Luto? Beit Avel? You've been to someone like that? Anyone ever been to there before? House of mourning? When you go into a house of mourning where someone is mourning, sitting on the floor, you've been to one before? Yeah? Have you been to one? Ever? Okay, when you go to a house of mourning, what are you supposed to say to the person? <laughs> Nothing. You're not supposed to say anything until they speak to you. If they start speaking to you, then you can respond. But until they do that, you don't say a word. When you leave, and if they haven't spoken to you, then you could say, there's a paragraph, if you're from South Africa, I wish you a long life, right? whatever it is. But you have having different things. I'm sorry for your loss, etc. But the bottom line is, what do you say? You say nothing to them. Why do you say nothing? Because there's nothing to say. Excellent. When a person goes ahead and they're in a state of mourning, what are you going to say to them? That's why it gets really awkward very quickly at these houses. Right? Someone sits down, they don't really know what to say. They're like, <clears throat> so the weather is cold. Like, it's like, of course it's cold. It's winter. Like, well, why, what are we talking about this? You understand? But no one really knows what to say. Everyone's uncomfortable. And they say, well, um, I know uh, he was a good guy. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he was good. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't say nice things once they approach the subject and they talk with you. But before that, what do we do is we say the following, listen. Without even speaking, I love you. I care for you. There's nothing I can really say to you, and you and I both know that. The only thing I'm going to say to you is, I'm here. You get it? Because it all depends. Where is a person coming from? Where is a person coming from? If a person is coming from an emotional standpoint, right? if we're coming from emotions, so then what's the answer to an emotional question? The answer is there's no answer to an emotional question. Because an emotional question is not a question. It's just a cry. Do you get it? Imagine someone who come over to that woman when she goes, why? Why is it happening? He said, <clears throat> I know why. It's the God has a plan and everything happens for a reason. What's the, what do you do to that guy? You knock him out and push him in the next open grave. Yeah? Don't write that down, by the way. That's not the, right? It's like, seriously? Is that Ashkenaz or Sephardic Halakha? Right? And says, what? And you go, you knock that. Why? Because what are you doing? But she wanted to know why. She was asking why. You know what I'm saying? So if she's asking why, I'm going to answer. It's not nice not to answer. It's not polite. Dude, she's not asking anything. She's just crying. She herself would say to you, what are you saying? Yeah? I'm just in a state of, of, of misery, in a state of pain. When a person, it's, it's almost like the same thing. The mission is a mission in Perky Elvis, which says, when a person's dead is lying before them, don't try to comfort them. Don't try to comfort someone when their dead is lying in front of them. You can go and you can be there, but don't pull games like, are you okay? I'm so sorry. Are you okay? What kind of stupid question? People are like, we don't know what to say. So someone like falls out of a car. Are you okay? Oh, no, I'm just dandy. Thank you so much. I don't mind. I do this every other Tuesday. What do you mean am I okay? I just fell out of a car. Yeah? Someone just lost a love. And are you okay? No, I'm not okay. Right? And as a kid, my daughter, you know, it's a natural instinct to say, are you okay? My daughter, we were walking. My wife and I were with my daughter. We were in an elevator. And it was one of these elevators that had like, it was like um, two doors. I don't know how to explain it. Not like this. It goes like this. But it's one door that like goes like one level and then it's like another level. You know what I'm saying? And in between, you can like stick your hand in a little. So my daughter, what's that? 
my daughter was standing next to it and her hand was there and the elevator started to open and my wife's like, oh my gosh, I'm like, what? I look and I pulled her hand out before, thank God, anything would ever happen. And she starts screaming and she's two years old. I'm like, oh no. I was like, Adina, are you okay? She goes, no. Right? And I was like thinking, what a stupid question. You know, like, but the funny thing is that she's old enough to know that like, she's not going to just say, I'm fine. She's like, no. And then like two minutes later, I'm like, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? And she's like, no. I'm like, oh God, again, you know, we just do it on reflex. But the point is the answer to an emotional question is there's no answer. It's almost like saying, what's the best thing to say to someone when they're angry? Sarcastically, what's the best thing? Calm down. Oh, oh, oh okay, I'll calm down. Thank you. Right? Are you quick? I should, your mama should calm down. Right? And it turns into the whole thing. Is that like, that's stupid. Don't say anything. A person's in a state of anger. A person's in a state of misery. A person's in a state of mourning. There's nothing to say. I believe this is an arbitrary number that I'm making up right now based on my own experience of my life and maybe from seeing other people. I would venture to say 85% of the questions when people ask why do bad things happen to good people are coming from emotions. And if somebody's asking an emotional question of why do bad things happen to good people, it doesn't matter what the answer is. You'll never be satisfied. And the reason you'll never be satisfied is because you're not asking a question. Does everybody get what I just said? Does this make sense? Now this happens to follow through in everything in life. If someone's approaching you with an emotional perspective and you answering them intellectually is just a waste of time. Yeah? Right? Your girlfriend comes or your mother, whoever it is, and maybe both, I don't know where you're from, but comes to you and says, uh, you know, I, I hate you because you never contact me and you never call me and like I never get to see you. And you're like, baby, let's talk about this, okay? Let's discuss this. What do you mean when you say I never call you? You see, I do call you. Like, let me show you my logs. Okay, let's sit down and discuss. You see, I, on January 3rd, I called you for four and a half minutes. On January 4th, what, what are you doing? Yeah? Person's like, well, what, what's happening over here? Right, stupid. When the woman's saying, you never call me, what is she saying? She She's like, I want you to call me. You don't call me. Right? You don't call me enough. I want you to call me. And to go through a whole intellectual process right now is just a silly waste of time. For a, 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 a woman who goes and says, you don't love me. No, what do you mean? I, let's, I do love you. Let me show you how. I'll express to you my emotions through what I've done in the past. What she's saying is, what? tell me you love me. You get it? To go and deal with an emotional question intellectually is a waste of time. You've got to deal with an emotional issue emotionally. So if someone goes, why? The answer is, I know, I'm sorry. And you give them a hug. That's it. You get it? So someone comes along and think about this for a second. Work it out. I'll give you an example. It's, I don't know who, if it applied to any of you who don't apply, you've experienced, haven't. A lot of times you find, let's say, if you grew up in a, in a secular home and a person then starts to become more observant, the parents sometimes, depends on the, on the, back, on the, on the, you know, the family makeup, but the parents sometimes take it a little bit personally. And you know, the kid comes home and they're all religious and whatever, and the parent's like, well, you think you're better? Like, what do you think? Like, oh, you can't eat in my house anymore? What, I'm not a good enough Jew? Like, what, what, you, what, 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 why do you got to do that? Why I got to do that? Why I got to do that? So you could sit down and explain, you know, well, the Torah says, right? Or you could say to them, Mom, Dad, I love you. All they're saying is they're scared they're going to lose you. You get it? And if we're getting all intellectual and the emotions, is a waste of time. Clear? So that's the idea so far. If we're coming from emotions, there's no answer because there's no question. This is an intellectual question. Most of you brought up emotional. When I said, how bad does it have to be? And you go, Holocaust, death, etc." That's all emotional. What you should have said is, stubbing your toe, paper cut, being a little too cold outside. Put your hand in your pocket, you want to take out a quarter, you accidentally take out a nickel. These are the questions we should have said. Do, do you understand? If you're only asking by massive things, that means you're not being intellectual. That means you're only asking when things start to shake you. That means you're, you're, you're stuck in emotions, in which case you're never going to get an answer. And you're going to have a problem with God. I know there's no God because the Holocaust. I know there's no God because how could it be just such a bad thing? How could it be there could be sick children? And I love people that sometimes when they try to go, go at me, they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah? What about a kid? What about a little baby? What about a little baby that's born without an arm? But it has two arms on the other side. And, and, it, and it has cancer and it goes through the Holocaust while driving a car blind <laughs> and getting raped by a gang of lions. What about that? <laughs> like, dude, that, I can't answer you. <laughs> That's absurd, yeah? And emotional. <laughs> get it? Okay, now let's start to shift a little. Now we can get to the other, what, uh, you know, remaining 15%. Why do bad things happen to good people? If we're asking from an emotional perspective, no answer. If you're asking from an intellectual perspective, 
Let's break it down. Here we go. So we're going to focus in on three different ideas <clears throat> to understand now why it would be that bad things, quote unquote, happen to good people. Some of them are going to be repeats, which is going to bring them out in another light. I'll spell them all out, then we'll break it down. Number one is something called negligence. Too long a word, and I don't know how to spell it. All right, that's called negligence. Another one is because what we call in Hebrew, mida keneged mida. In English, that's called measure for measure. All right, everybody gets the idea? Measure for measure. If I wanted to ruffle your feathers, I would say it differently. You deserve it. Okay. Now, let's take a look at number three, is that it's good for you. Number one, negligence. Number two, measure for measure. Number three, good for you. Let's take a look. Number one, I think personally, we got 85. Probably I would say another 10% is because of this one over here. Guy wakes up, he's like, my foot is killing me. What a bad things happen to good people. <laughs> Dude, you tied your shoe too tight. You can't blame God for being an idiot. You understand? If you're stupid, and then something happens to you, I don't understand. Like, I, I know I jumped in front of a train, but if, you know, if God loved me, you know what I mean? And says, no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> you jump in front of a train, you're going to get hurt. You put your hand in a fire, you're going to get burned. And you can't blame God for that. Does it make sense? How about this one? I don't understand why I feel so sick. What'd you do last night? I don't know, I drank like 12 Polish butterflies. You know what I mean? And I got I just had it straight up. You know what I mean? Where am I? Where am I? You understand? Like, why am I so exhausted? Yeah? Why don't I feel good? Right? Because you don't treat yourself properly. Person goes there, there was a doctor who told me about this guy who came into his office. And this guy, he, he claims he needs knee surgery. He says, you know why I need knee surgery? Guy says, because it's, uh, it's hereditary, you know? We have in the family that we got bad knees. Doctor says to me, he might be right, he might be hereditary, but there might be another reason. When you put 30 people in an elevator that can only hold one, you're gonna have a problem with the elevator. Does everybody get it? The idea is what? <clears throat> Tint. Yeah, right, fat guy in a little coat. If you go ahead, and you're, you're this you're gordo in a little coat, right? A right, guy, you know, lit. You get, I don't understand why my knee's hurting. It's hereditary. Well, it's hereditary. <laughs> if you weigh 1,200 pounds, your knees are not going to hold you, yeah? Don't blame God for being stupid. I had a friend who epitomized this idea. He was once rollerblading off of his roof, and he, he <laughs> said to us, this is a true story, we were 15 years old, he goes, to go, guys, if I don't make it, give my hockey equipment to my kids. They're like, dude, you don't have any kids, right? Yeah. This is like, then we go off. We were, walk, we were walking together once, and we hear this thud. We turn around, the guy walked into a tree. He's like, where'd that come from? We're like, straight out of the mushrooms, man. Straight out of the mushrooms. What do you mean, where'd that come from? Watch where you're going. What the bad things happen to you? Right? And then, where did it come? What do you mean, where did it come from? Watch where you're going. Get it? That's number one. How many times do we live our life in a way where we mess ourselves over, and then we go ahead and we say, it's God. Look at the way you dealt with your life, and you'll start to see. Is that clear? Okay, move on. Number two is something called Mida Kenegid Mida. The Talmud asks the following question. What should a person do when they find themselves in a scenario where they experience a tragedy? And the example it gives is the one I gave before, where you put your hand in your pocket, you want to take out a quarter, and God forbid, this should happen to none of us. But you put your hand in your pocket, and instead of taking out a quarter, you take out a nickel. I know, I'm sorry. What should you do? Now that's a tragedy. How come? Because it's not good. So therefore it's bad. 0. 0.00001, but we should be asking the questions. We ignore those things because we say insignificant. But that's when we should be asking the most intellectually about those type of ideas. Okay, so now... But I don't mean when you have no quarters in your pocket. Yeah, you say, oh, another non-quarter. You didn't put any quarters in, right? But if you have quarters in the nickel, so what's going on? Maybe, says the Gemara, what should you do? You fash face by myself. Look into your actions. What do you mean look into your actions? The Talmud is saying a fabulous, amazing, incredible statement. Look into your actions. In Judaism, me the connection, me the mean measure for measure, there is a connection between what happens to us in this world and the way that we behave and the way that we live our life. Nothing is random in Judaism. 
Nothing is random in life. When something happens, there's a purpose. There's a reason. Now, sometimes, as we're going to get into number three, not yet, I'm just explaining a little, sometimes you'll never be able to tell what it is. Other times, it could be very clear what it is. It's like the Chavetz Chaim once said, there was, a, there was a guy who was very not nice to an almana, to a widow. It was a woman, and the Torah says explicitly, if you're not nice to a widow, God himself says, I'm coming at you. I'm coming for you. Don't mess with widows. Don't mess with orphans. Don't mess with those who don't have anyone to protect them because I'm going to protect them, fool. And then you going down. You understand? Oh, yeah, God? Yeah. So what happens? There was a guy who was once during the times of the Chafetz Chaim. Have you heard of the Chafetz Chaim before? Right? For those who haven't, it was a great, great sage. Lived in the 1800s, 1839 to 1933. Same as Rabbi Saul Mayer Cohen Kagan. And there was a guy who was not nice to a woman. He like kicked her out of the, out of the house like when he, he was, you know, he evicted her from this property, whatever. He was not nice to her. The end of him was that he basically got eaten by dogs. The, 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 what, he, the vicious dogs came and like ate him. And the Chafetz Chaim said, see, you mess with the widow, God comes for you. So someone came to the Chafetz Chaim and said, how could you say that? You don't know the, all the reasons for things. Like, how could you say that that's what it was? And the Chavetz Chaim said, there's certain things that are obvious. In other words, that, yeah, you might not be able to know. Maybe you don't. But when the Torah says, don't mess with the widow, and if you do, I'm coming for you. And then, like, hey, all of a sudden, this guy, something comes for him, right? You understand? Don't be stupid, right? On the one hand, you can't say, all right, that's exactly the reason. On the other hand, you could, you could maybe assume it's a direction. You hear? When a person goes out and something happens to them, look into your actions. There was a guy who was once walking down the street, a rabbi. He was walking down the staircase. He fell down the staircase. Students came to run to pick him up. He said, one second, leave me. They left him on the floor. He's like, rabbi, well, he says, leave me alone for a minute. After about a minute, two minutes, he said, okay, help me up. And they helped him up. They're like, what were you doing? He said, I was trying to figure out. I was being careful. My shoes were tied. The steps were not slippery. I wasn't running. Why did I fall down the staircase? So I was trying to think, is there anything that maybe I had done during my day, during this past week, something that I did that maybe I deserved something in retribution for the idea that I did that? And he didn't say what it was. He said, I felt satisfied with something, so therefore I, I now feel like, okay, if you can help me up. In other words, there's a relationship and connection between things that happen to you and what you maybe have done in your life. Nothing is random. So others would call this karma. You heard of that before, karma? Well, it comes from somewhere. It's called Judaism. Right? That's called measure for measure. These things are not random. How could you measure exactly? A guy gets a new car accident, the other guy gets the exact car accident, the exact street, the exact time. No. But something will happen that will bring out some sort of retribution for the things that we've done. This is not random. And everybody gets what's coming to them for better or worse. Measure for measure is not just a negative thing. It's also a positive thing. When you do something positive, you're going to get positive measure for measure for that, which you've done. Okay, now let's take it a step further. Everybody with me so far? Is this, is this, you cannot 100% agree with me or have a question, but does it make sense what I'm saying so far? Is this stuff random? Is this like, that, that makes no sense, that's totally out there, or does this make somewhat sense to you? Makes, this is sensical. This is like, hey, listen, it's a God. There's nothing that's random. There's something going on over here. There's a reason and a purpose. So now let's, let's build a little bit further. We got the idea of, of, of negligence. We got the idea of me the can I give me the measure for measure. You deserve it. Yeah? Now let's move on to the next one of it's good for you. And then, God, if I don't answer your question, please ask again. But I think I'm going to answer it. Okay? I'm going to attempt to answer it. Okay? So we got, uh, I'm not really, by the way. I'm not really. You're not going to be satisfied on one end. You will be in the other. You'll see what I mean. Here we go. Number three is the idea that it's good for you. What does it mean that it's good for you? It means that you know what? Thank God this happened, because had this not happened, then something else would have happened a lot worse. You understand what I mean by that? Have you ever had things in your, in your own life where you've experienced, like, you're like, ah, why did that happen? And then after, it's like, whoa, thank God. Yeah, sometimes they're extreme, sometimes they're very little, right? But the bottom line is, we have to be, as intellectual human beings, we have to open our eyes to start to see things, start to recognize, like, there's purpose for everything that's going on, right? And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about that it's good for you. There was, uh, let, let's say you have a, a, a child, right? A little kid. Two-year-old picks up a paper clip. Now, there's a general rule that little kids have no clue what they're doing. They don't know. Only when you start saying something do they recognize if something is good or bad, right? So let's say a little kid picks up a paper clip, and you go to them, and you're like, you know, it's, it's your kid, right? Your two-year-old. You're like, Chucky, it's your two-year-old daughter. I don't know why you named her that, right? But okay. 
You're sitting down in your recliner, chilling, drinking a beer, watching the game. Yo, yo. Chucky's in the other corner, picks up a purple clip, and you're like, Chucky. So Chucky looks, you're like, no. So Chucky doesn't know what you're saying no to, right? He's not you're saying no. So they kind of play hot and cold, like to try to see where the problem is. Then they start playing the paper clip and they go, no. And they go, oh, right? This is the problem. So they open it, yeah? So you're like, Chucky, no. They're like, ooh, I'm getting there. So they open it again, right? And they're like, you're like, Chucky, right? Now Chucky starts to like walk in circles until you finally, Chucky then hears you saying no again. Oh, that's the direction to not go in. So they start walking that direction. You get it? Right? So as they're walking towards an outlet, with an open paper clip, and you're sitting in the corner, and they start walking, and you know, you're like, Chucky! And then it keeps going, you're like, Chucky! And you start raising your voice, and Chucky's thinking, why is he yelling at me, right? But then you start going more, and you're running, so then you get up out of your seat, you're like, no, you drop your beer, but you grab it, and you put it down softly, and then you keep running, you start running, and then they, they start running, because they see you running, and then it's at the end, right? it's almost at the end, it's the final count, and they're going, what happens? They see you coming, like, no, they dive for the outlet, you dive at the last second, and you, boom, you nail them. You're like, yeah, sacked. And the one you're hard behind, you pick them up and you spike them. And you realize, how's my kid, right? <laughs> and as that kid's lying on the floor like this, holding the paper clip, they're thinking, why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> What's the answer? You just saved their life. You get it? It's a wake-up call. It's a warning. Don't do that. These things are happening. It could be a couple of angles here. One is you're stupid, right? You're negligent, but you're in a fire, you get burned. Another one is number two is measure for measure. This one, by the way, of negligence, I want to explain something. This is what the Gemara says, the Talmud states, everything is in the hands of God except for cold and hot. Which means if you put your hand in a fire, you're going to get burned. If you go outside in your underwear in Antarctica, you're going to get sick. Yeah? That's not up to God. God leaves that to you. You have the ability to be stupid. Number two is the measure for measure. Number three is that it's good for you, meaning it's a wake-up call, it's a warning. There's a story told about Solomon, King Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech. Have you heard of him before? Shlomo HaMelech, Solomon? They say he was Chacham Kolodim, he's the wisest of all men. And one time Solomon went to one of, went to, you know, one of his uh, subjects, came to him and said, you know, he, he knew a lot, not a lot, he knew everything. Except for maybe Paraduma, but he knew, he knew everything. And one of the things he knew was the language of the animals. He spoke the language of the animals. In particular, this guy comes to him and says he wants to learn the language of the birds. How come? But this language of the birds, apparently when birds are chirping, they're speaking the future. So this guy comes, he's like, I want to learn the language of the birds. So he's like, uh, get out of here. You know, I'm not teaching the language of the birds. He's like, come on. He pastors him until finally he's like, okay. He teaches him the language of the birds. The guy's walking down the street and he hears this bird going, chirpity chirp, chirp, chirp. And he's like, what? He's talking about me? And one bird goes to the next. See that guy over there? The other bird goes, yeah. He goes, guy's going to get hit by a horse today. And the guy was like, whoa, better watch myself, right? He's walking and normally he comes to a corner of a building where normally he would have just kept going, but he stopped, stuck his head out, and then flows back as a horse comes running by. He's like, whoo, thank God, you know? <laughs> it's good that I know this, yeah? It's good that I, <laughs> wow, yeah? And he keeps going. Here's another bird going, chirpity chirp. Chirp, 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 chirp. And he goes, like, you serious? And he's like, why? He goes, that guy, he's going to fall into a manhole. You know, like in the streets, the sewer covers, right? He's going to fall into one of those manholes. So the guy's like, all right. So he keeps going. He sees a manhole in the distance, keeps walking. Right when he gets to the manhole, he stops. It lifts up and moves over. And one of the construction workers comes out. He was working under there. He would have fallen in the manhole. He's like, this is awesome. Keeps going. And all of a sudden, he hears... Chirp, 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 chirp. They all go, goodbye, right? And he's like, what? You can see that guy over there? He goes, he's going to die. He's like, whoa, whoa, one second. I could avoid a horse. I could avoid a manhole. I can't avoid, I'm going to die. You know, I need more specifics, yeah? He goes back to Shlomo Mel. He's like, what'd you do to me? You know what I'm saying? I'm going to die. He's like, what are you talking about? He tells him the whole story. He goes, you fool. Why were you going to get hit by a horse? And why were you going to fall in a manhole? It's to wake you up, to start thinking about your life and where you are in order to make some sort of change. You don't get the point? It's over. What happened at the end? Don't know. But what happens, right, he killed himself. Right, but what we have is what? No, I'm just kidding about that part. Right, but funny joke. Anyway, what we have is what? Is that understand 
that these things are good for you. They're wake-up calls. They're trying to get you to stop and just digest a little. Figure out what you're doing with your life. Where you're headed. Where are you going? I'll tell you, there was a, a story, a very famous story. I hope I don't butcher it too much. But the story about an athlete who was in a terrible car accident and became a quadriplegic. Anyone know someone who's, uh, who's paralyzed? Or, right, you, know, so, you know someone personally? Uh, well, Anyone know someone personally? No, none of you? You know someone? I don't know. Uh, okay. You know someone who's paralyzed? Could be, eventually, right? Multiple sclerosis over time, right? It starts to build. But th this particular guy, I mean, you should never know someone, I mean, but the idea is that there was a fellow who, a Jewish guy, athlete, terrible car accident, gets paralyzed from the neck down. Now, you could probably imagine that's a bit depressing, yeah? And this person, he didn't even want to live anymore. But there's nothing he could do about it. <laughs> he, he's paralyzed. He would kill himself if he could, but he can't, right? And you have your ups and your downs, and your ups and your downs. And one day, he's thinking to himself, he's like, he's like, what's the point? What's the point of life? He's very low, right? He's like, what's the point? I can't run anymore. I can't jump. I can't throw a ball. What's the point of living? But then he caught himself, and he said, wait a minute. What did I just say? I can't run I can't jump. I can't throw a ball. What's the point of living? In other words, the point of life is to run, jump, and throw a ball? That's life? Even when I wasn't paralyzed, I didn't have a life. You get it? Now this particular fellow, who was Jewish, started to think a little bit, started to work, and he became observant, and he taught. He became a rabbi for 40 years until he died. Everything's in your mind. Everything's up in here. Everything comes down to what? Forget your body. Forget, I mean, God forbid we should have our body and all our capabilities, but understand that it's all, what are you headed towards? Where are you going? What's the purpose? Had this guy, and a lot of people say this, had they not gone through certain suffering in their life, they never would have gotten to where they were that day. I used to use an example, which I'll use, which I'm scared to use now, but you know the guy, I had Oscar Piss, Piss something, Pistorius, right? the, the, the runner from South Africa? You guys know what I'm talking about? Right. So before he killed his girlfriend, he used to be a good example, yeah? Because <laughs> this is a guy who, they call him like Blade Runner. He ran the 2012 Olympics, right? Even though he, he had both of his legs from the knee down amputated when he was 11 months old, right? 11 months old, and he had both his knees amputated. I was listening to the BBC, Do -do -do, the most trusted news station, besides CNN. And, uh, and, they, and they had this guy... They had this guy on, on the news. They were speaking about it. Before he, this is years before he killed anyone, right? Um, if he did. Okay. And the point is what? That they asked him, they said, I couldn't believe this. I was driving. The guy asked him, because it was discussing, will he run in 2012? It was a big controversy, right? Will he run with, will it be in the Special Olympics? Will it be in the, where, where is he going to, in the, in the paralegia? Whatever, right? And, said, and he was going to run in the regular Olympics. And the, the newscaster asked him, if you could have legs, would you want them? I, I, I literally almost crashed my car. I was, I was like, are you, what, what kind of question is that? If you could have your legs, would you want them? Oh, of course, right? Like, well, what kind of stupid question? There was a pause, and then the guy says, you know, I think about this a lot. On the one hand, of course, who wouldn't? I'm like, yeah. It's like, Friedman, quiet down. He goes, but on the other hand, if I didn't go through this, I wouldn't be where I was today. There's no way I'd be with so much drive and so much whatever if I didn't go through this. People who go through experiences in their life, challenging experiences in their life, and they overcome them, they become greater than they ever could have been. People who don't have the challenges, they never even know where they could be, right? That's really what the point of a challenge is, ultimately. The point of a Nisaya and the point of a challenge is for you to know how much you can be. God knows what you can be, but you don't know what you can be. Therefore, you have to be put through a test to be able to come to understanding and recognition you can be so much more than you think you are. Does everybody get this? So therefore, good for you means either it's preventing you from the worst thing happening, like my grandfather, my wife's grandfather, 
who was who misunderstood when they was leaving uh, Czechoslovakia, and then you know during World War II afterwards they left, and he misunderstood the language, and he didn't get on a plane. He missed the plane, and the plane crashed. Everyone on board died. He's like, I'm not taking a plane anymore. He took a boat. No one told him they could sink. Right? But the bottom line is what he made it. Yeah. Because you go out and you're like, you know what? These things are the worst thing in the world. Poof, thank God it happened. It's good for you. It's building you. It's waking you up. It's understand what's going on. People who have the challenges in life and they break under them, you miss the point. It's for you to grow. Hey, maybe you did something stupid. Look into your actions. See what you've done. Are you silly? No, I wasn't silly. Okay. So maybe you did something wrong you shouldn't have done, inappropriate. You know what I did? I realized that. Or no, I, I didn't. Okay, then maybe it's good for you. Sometimes you'll see it. Sometimes you'll never see it in your life. Okay, now we're going to start to get in. I have to, I'm going to come back to this. We'll end with coming back to this, but I want to first mention your point. Right? You said Holocaust? Is that, is, that what you, is that you asked that? Okay. So number six is the following. To ask a question about anyone other than yourself is almost a waste of time. I have no idea what you've done in your life. How can I go and make a judgment if you're good or if you're bad? What about the great righteous ones? We know them. No, you don't. You have no idea what they've done behind closed doors, and I'm not accusing them, God forbid. I'm just saying you don't know. You have no idea what a person has done in their life, let alone your, your, yourself. You don't even know, I mean, the, your own part, your, your spouse, your mother, your father, your brothers. Have you ever learned something about someone that you've known for many years and learned something about them that you didn't know about them? You're like, oh, I didn't know that. You've been on for 10 years. I didn't know that. You've been on for 20 years. I didn't know that. How come? You don't know everything. You have no idea what's going on. Put aside reincarnation. Put aside other souls. You have no idea what's going on. So if you want to ask the question, the accurate and appropriate question is not why do bad things happen to good people. It's why do bad things happen to good people like me? That's the only question you could ask. I can't ask about you. I can't ask about you. I can't ask about the Holocaust. I don't know what they did in their lives. I don't know what they didn't do. I just know me. And even me, I'm not so sure about. So the only real, accurate, pointed, practical question is what about things happen to good people like me? And I can answer that for you. Ready? I'm bad. Story goes like this. I heard this story by Rabbi Zeldman. Does anyone know who that is, Rabbi Zeldman? He's a rabbi teacher here in Eshat Torah. He said the following story. I'll, I'll keep it short because I have three others to tell you. So the story is that he got married and a bunch of his friends got married at the same time, right, within a couple of months, within a couple of years of each other. And people started having babies, right? There was one couple that just wasn't having babies. Now that's very, very hard for a couple, right? When you have all your friends who are having kids and, and, and let's say your family has kids and whatever, but you don't have a kid, it's very hard. Eventually... After like five, six years, this woman has a kid. Everyone else has like four or five kids, right? Haredim, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten kids, yeah? But this woman, finally, she has one kid. She's so excited, right? She has this beautiful baby boy. And the whole community is excited for her. Three months later, the woman goes to check on the baby in the crib. And the baby is not moving. She freaks out. She calls her friend. She's like, what do I do? She didn't even know what to do. And, and she says, call, you know, 911, not Salah here, whatever. They come, unfortunately, SIDS. The baby died. Can you imagine such a thing? I mean, God, come on, what are you doing? Is this a joke? I don't have kids for six months, says this woman. And then after not having kids for six months, then their baby dies? Like, well, what are you doing to me, right? The father said, for the entire shiva, right, with a mourning period, and people come to visit, he doesn't remember even one person. He was in such another world of like, what is going on here? What did this baby do? Why did this baby didn't do anything? Why does baby deserve it? The next couple weeks, walking around in the days, after about a month, the father then came to the realization. He said the following idea. He kept saying, he's like, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? I'm sorry, why did this happen to the baby, the baby, the baby? Till finally then he shifted and he said, you know what, I'm never going to know why this happened to the baby. I'm not the baby and I can't understand why it happened to the baby. He shifted and started asking, why did it happen to me? And he started introspection, started in his own life, and started thinking, trying to figure out, why would this happen to me? Now, did he come to conclusion, not conclusion? I don't know. But I could just tell you that after this happened, he then had another kid 
And when I heard this story six years ago, I heard the story uh, uh, seven years ago when I heard the story, he had just had, their, they just had their sixth baby. They had six kids in a row. They were catching up. And, and uh, they were celebrating that Shabbat of the, of the baby they were having. Can you imagine what kind of parents they are? Can you imagine what kind of parents they are? After not having children for six years, having a child, a child dying, now getting other children. Imagine, I'm not saying God forbid God says, okay, now you get your point, you'll be a good parent, right? <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm just pointing out that we have to shift off other people and start looking at ourselves because we're the only ones that can learn anything from it. When we learn it from ourselves, then maybe we can go a little bit further. Okay, gentlemen, here we go. Story, story, recap done. The story that I want to share with you, um, then story, sorry. Story, story, recap, story done. Uh, the, the good for you. There are certain things in our life that we'll never, ever see how it's good for us. Other times in our life where we'll see how it's good for us and then we'll be able to learn from it. But in both, we have to understand that, hey, God knows what he's doing. In which case, even if I don't understand it completely, I know that God is good. Although in the world we live in, we don't always see that. Let's take a look and see. Story number one is a story where the people never, ever saw it. There was a, a German, there was, a, there was um, World War II, the, uh, one of the last ships that left, one of the last ships that left from from Germany, made its way to England. When they got to England, there was a lot of politics, obviously, right, and a lot of uh, issues, and they wanted to go, and England didn't want to keep them there. They wanted to send them away. But they're not going to send them back to Nazi Germany, so they decide that they're going to send them to, to Australia. Send them off to Australia. Now, Australia, does anybody know the history of Australia, how it started? Right, it was basically for criminals. Australia was for criminals, right? That's what it was. And what happened was that these people who just came out of the Holocaust, of the horrors, and then they make their way, they come towards, you know, they think they're free, and then they're sent out, like, what's going on here? They have nothing left but, like, identification, maybe, the shirts on their back, a couple of possessions, that's it. Now, nobody wants to take these, these people to Australia, so what they do is they, they let a bunch of criminals go. And they say, you take the boat to Australia. So they say, great. So they get in the boat. They start going towards Australia. What do the criminals do? They do what criminals do. They criminalize, yeah? And they went around the boat, and then whatever the people had left, they took. If it was valuable, they kept it. If it wasn't valuable, they just threw it over into the ocean. Can you imagine these people, what's going through their minds? What did you do to me? I go ahead, I have nothing. Then you go ahead and you take everything, the very last thing. God, what are you doing? They make their way to Australia. They live out their lives, the end. Many of them, if not all of them, never knowing the back end of the story. One of the grandchildren of one of the survivors went to research what happened like with these boats and found out what happened was when this boat left England, there were German warships, U-boats, that were all over the place, submarines, they were everywhere. And one of them spotted it and was going to bomb it but then said, hold on, first let's check out and see what it is. So they sent out another little boat to go look, and they found German documents and German possessions floating in the water. And they go, oh, it's probably just a bunch of Germans that are vacationing or that they're making their way somewhere. It's a British boat, but there's a German, so what we'll do is we'll wait till it's on its way back, and then we'll blow it up. And this U-boat, this, this submarine, sent out to every other submarine, don't touch the boat. Don't touch the boat until it gets to its destination, and then bomb it. And that's what happened. You know what saved the life of all the Jews in that boat? The fact that they threw all their possessions in the water. You see that? Something's happened, and we never, ever see the back end of the story. Sometimes we do see the back end. Here comes the next story, recap, and then the last one. The story is about, again, the Holocaust. There was a brother and a sister, a family, but there's a brother and a sister that got separated. They, one of the Nazis, you know, they, they took the sister and the brother was out and he come back home and goes, where's my sister? He said they took her to the bunker out in the forest. He's like, what? So he starts without even thinking, 16 years old, whatever, he just starts running into the forest towards a bunker. Nobody runs towards a Nazi bunker, you understand? But he starts running towards, he busts open the door and the guy sitting there gets a little startled. He's like, what's going on here? He goes, give me back my sister. And the guy gets his composure. He's like, <laughs> Hans. Fritz, Achten, he wants his sister back. <laughs> Should we give back the Schwester? Should we give him back his sister? And he hears his sister screaming in the other room. And they're like, yeah, 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 let's give him back his sister. Yeah, let's give him back, yeah. <laughs> let's do it, you know. <laughs> let's do it. Tell you what, kid. 
we'll give you back your sister. When you grow hair on your palms. <laughs> so the kid goes, okay. And he sticks out his hands. And there's hair on his palms. They start freaking out. They're like, it's a sign of the devil. Like, just take her and get out of here. And they threw them both out and they ran away and they survived the war. A bunch of years later, somebody came to interview this guy. They found him living in Muncie, New York. And then when they found him, and sure enough, he still has his hair on his palms. Like, dude, what is that? He said when he was a little kid, he got terribly burned on his hands. And they have to do a skin graft. And they grafted skin from an area of his body that had hair. He was so embarrassed, and he thought, like, why? But he ended up seeing that the very thing that he thought, like, why, is what ended up saving him and his sister. You see that? Some people end up seeing why something actually ends up being good. Okay, quick recap. Done. Then last story. Here we go. So we're starting to begin answering the question, why do I have good people? So no, one more to understand what's bad and who's good, right? Nathan. What's bad? Who's good? <laughs> oh. All right, so that's the idea. We understand we make all these assumptions. We got Dennis Rader. I understand he's like, a terrible guy. We got a needle. That's actually a good thing. Get it? Let me go on a little bit further and say God is all knowing, all powerful, and all good. If he's all knowing, all powerful, and all good, well, if not, if it's just random, then you're totally fine. It's just random. But if not random, then what's going on? Well, maybe we didn't know. Maybe it wasn't powerful. Maybe it wasn't good. No, but although still, we got the question. We got a little bit further. How bad does something have to be in order to be born? The question, why do I have good people? Point zero, 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 one. Which means what? If God's 100% good, as soon as something doesn't look 100%, all of a sudden we got our question. If you're only asking it when the Holocaust and death and whatever, that means what, baby? You being emotional, you know what the answer is? No answer. Why? Because there's no question. A person's coming from like, ah, the answer is, oh. If someone comes from, I really want to know, okay, then we get to the next level of discussion. Before that, you got no thing. So then we, after that, we got the concept of what? Of the idea of intellectual, right? The intellect. Intellect comes on the over here. Number five, right? Negligence, measure, measure, good for you. Negligence means you can't believe in God. If you're stupid, right? You eat too much, you're going to feel sick. You smoke too much, you're going to get hot. You drink too much, you're going to get because I got it. Um, um, um. All right, you know what I'm saying? Right now, it's the idea of negligence. After that, we come measure for measure. You deserve it. What do you think is happening? You understand? If I should myself, look into your actions, there's a correlation between that which you do and that which happens. There's a correlation with that which you do and that which happens. When something happens, stop thinking, grab it, falls down, starts to think, why would I have fallen? Okay, I think I have something which answered for me, and therefore I'm going to go with it. Don't just live life like, oh, it's okay, it's just random. No, think about it. There's a purpose. And after that, after that, we got something that is good for you. What do you mean it's good for you? Either it's good for you because, hey, it's going to prevent something bad from happening to you, right? Chuck, hey, right? Or the answer, what? And ultimately, understand the concept is that this protects you and it's a wake-up call the birds right sha na 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 whoop chirp chirp woof woof dogs are another language right what happens over there go ahead and realize oh my god well, I'm gonna die of course you can pick up those things of course then I'm gonna, the person you're living anymore that's the deal that's good for you you can't ask questions why the Holocaust happened you want to be the devil be the devil don't, don't advocate for him right so we have to that ultimately come down to the book of people like me I don't know what happened to that other person I have no idea what they've been to. I don't know the reincarnation on the souls afterwards all I know is me therefore I have to ask why do bad things have good people like me and actually learn from the people if you don't learn from the experiences then there was no purpose whatsoever there was, but you missed it. If you missed it, then there was no purpose. And ultimately, good for you is it builds you up, it raises you, become a different person. Like we talked about that murderer who used to be a good example, right? The guy, the Blade Runner, right? It happens to Incon because that had not been the, the person, the paraplegic. He changes his entire life because he wakes up. And sometimes we're running so fast, we don't even notice, and we need to be stopped just to think and to work it out what's the right thing to be doing. Okay, did we miss anything? Story with the U boat, story with the hands, and uh, good. All right, end off with the last thing. The last thing is the following, another story that there was a guy, everything was going wrong for him in his life. He was married, he, he had kids, he had a business, he had a house, he had everything. His wife died, his kids died, his business died, his house died, it was terrible. His house just died one day, a heart attack. All right, he lost his money, he lost everything. He's like, what's going on? I, mean, I stubbed his toe, the middle toe, you know the middle toe, the middle one, which is protected? He stubbed the middle, ow, he stubbed his middle toe. Everything was going wrong. He decides he wants to figure out what's going on. He goes to a great Kabbalist by the name of the Rashash of Shalom Sharabi. And anyone heard of him before? A big Kabbalist. Living here in Jerusalem a couple hundred years ago. He goes to visit him and he comes into his office. And he's got his right hand man, there's you know, a secretary guy who's there, and he's like, uh, what can I do for you? He's like, I'm here to see the Rashash. I gotta know what's going on with my life. He's like, have a seat, I'll be right with you. The guy sits down. As soon as he sits down, bam, he's out. He looks around, and all of a sudden, everything is white. Everything is white. And he's like, what's going on here? It's crazy. And he hears in the distance, <sighs> looks up and he sees what he thinks is, looks like a locomotive, looks like a massive train. And this train starts coming towards him. And he's like, what is this? As it gets closer and closer, it's this big white train. And it's got a cart after 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 cart of these big white 
men. Some of them are big and strong and muscular. Some of them are scrawny. Some of them are missing limbs. Some are disproportionate. Some of them are just hands, cousin it. Right? Some of them are just, you know, thing. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And then it passes them and it keeps going. He's like, well, I got nothing to do, so I guess I'll just walk in that direction. So he starts following. And then all of a sudden he hears again, do all aboard. Da-da. 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 I, I, I. And this big black locomotive comes, and he looks, and Ozzy's driving, and he's hitting a bat's head off. And he goes and he sees this thing, and he's like, What is this? He says, Cart after cart, and there was a black train, right? He says, Cart after cart after cart after cart after cart filled with these guys. Some of them are big, muscular, and strong. Some of them are missing limbs. Some of them are just proportionate. Some of them are just hands. And the whole thing, get it? Same thing. And it keeps going. And then to make the story a little shorter, he sees the same thing, and dude, and all he looks at it, now he sees a gray train. Same thing, same exact thing. And he's like, What's going on? And he comes to this big door, so he knock, 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 and I won't have hands. And he walks in. And he sees in the middle of this area this massive scale. You know these scales like this? Like they have on Rosh Hashanah, you send cards like, Happy Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> hope you don't die, right? So what happens, he gets this, this big scale and he's like, Oh my gosh. He goes, Welcome to the judgment of so and so, the son of so and so. And he's like, That's me. <laughs> and now the guy hears a voice again. Will all of this guy's mitzvot, all of the positive things that he's done, all of the commandments that he followed, please stand up? So Slim Shady pops out. And that white train comes. Those big, strong, muscular people with the mitzvot and the commandments that he fulfilled with kavanah, with intent, with thinking, with working, with growing, with building. Yeah, yeah. And he put into it and he did it with a fervor and with thought. The ones that were a little bit scrawnier, which he did him, but he wasn't really putting into it. The ones scrawny, he wasn't really paying attention. The ones just like a hand is what? Is when it's like he just did it without even paying attention. You understand? And it starts piling on one side of the scale, and the scale starts to move. All of a sudden, bam, hits the floor. He's like, yes. Yes, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Another one popped out. And it goes and jumps on the scale, and he's like, yes. And eventually, then you go, any more? And the hand jumps out. Comes on. He says, all right. Now it goes, well, all of this person sins. All of the averos, all of the negative things that he's done in his life, please stand up. The black train rolls out. The big, muscular ones come out. Those are the ones, the sins that he did with passion, you know, that he thought about, that he planned, that he found a nice little getaway, that he locked the door, that he videotaped. You know what I'm saying. Well, I was, what do you think? I'm like a, eating a cheeseburger. What? What were you thinking? Same thing, right? He goes and does these things. Yeah, those are the ones, the big strong ones. The other ones are a little bit weaker. It's like you did a sin, but you weren't really giving into it. You're kind of. And then one little letter and the little hands, it's just you did it, but you weren't paying attention at all. Get it? And it starts to get in the scale. And he's like, uh oh. And it starts to lift up. And he's like, uh oh. And it starts to get right. It's 60, it's 30, 70, and then it's 40, 60, and then it's 45, 55, and then it's 49, 51, and then it's 50, 51, which is impossible. Right? But then it switches over, and he's like, oh my gosh, no. And it flips. He's like, no, no. Oh, beep. Another one pops out. Right? And it goes like, no, no. And all of a sudden it keeps going, it's like 70, 38, and it hits the floor. He's like, oh my gosh. Any more? And the last one pops out, bam. All of a sudden, the music starts playing. You're on a highway to hell, right? But then someone comes on. It's all right, dude. Don't worry, because it's a stairway to heaven. I'll show you where it is, right? But what bottom line is, what happens? Like, no, please, what's gonna be? Nah, okay. And there he is, and he's like, this over. And then all of a sudden, he hears, "Will all of this man's pain and suffering, all the troubles and travails and things that he went through in his life, please stand up?" That great train pulls out. The big muscular ones were the ones when, God forbid, he lost a spouse, he lost his children, a little smaller, he's lost his business, a little smaller, he stubbed his toe, a little smaller. It was like when he, he didn't pick up the right coin from his pocket, and you get the idea, so on and so forth. And it starts piling on the side of the mitzvot, of the positive. And he's like, yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it starts going, and all of a sudden now it's 7 30, 70, then 40, 60, then 55, 45, and then he gets up there. He's like, more, <laughs> more. He's like, defense. <laughs> right? He's like, more pain. He's like, give me more, please. More. He's like, I need more. He's like, more, more pain. Give me the pain. And it's 49, 51. He's like, no, I need more. Give me the pain. Give me the pain. <laughs> and then he wakes up. And the secretary goes, the Rishash will now see you. He's like, I'm good. He walks out, bangs his head. He's like, thank God. 
You see, people, on the one hand, it's we learn from it. We grow from it. Understand the idea that the things that be going on in our life, we got to watch. Don't be stupid, right? Watch what you've been doing. It's good for you. But understand that anything we go through in this world takes off any sort of pain and suffering in the next world. We don't ask for it. We don't beg. We don't pray for it. We ask that we don't have to go through the tests. But if we do, we accept it and we recognize that ultimately this is for our good. Any questions, comments, stories, jokes, attacks, please keep them verbal and physical. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. See you when I see you. If I don't, then I won't take care and bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>